Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the opening of a seminar is so important that if you will indulge me, I'm going to read a short prepared speech before the seminar itself begins. Once upon a time, you had a dream. You saw life as an exciting challenge and you took a gutsy chance. You made a terrifying leap into the unknown and survived to experience the sweet taste of success, victory. I don't know when this was, but I do know you did it, otherwise you would not be sitting here in this room today. Perhaps it was a death-defying skateboard or bike trick. Maybe it was climbing the tallest tree in the park or asking out your first date. Many of you will have, at one time, taken that frightening step of starting your own business. Stacking all your chips on the table and betting everything you own on your ability to win. Whatever you did, you took what I call a quantum leap. You challenged the world and you were invincible. You fought, you dared, and you won. Then something happened. You allowed your self-doubt to pierce your armor. You listened to the naysayers of this world and started to believe them. You started to question your abilities. What if my success was just a fluke? Maybe I got lucky. Supposing I can't repeat this stunt again, what will people say? You started to falter. You started to doubt. In short, you stopped playing to win and began to play not to lose. I'm here to tell you there's a very big difference between playing to win and playing not to lose. It's the difference between super success and lukewarm mediocrity, between winning the game of life and losing or barely surviving. This seminar has one purpose only, to rekindle within you the searing flame of desire, desire to make another quantum leap, then another and another until you reach stratospheric levels of success and leave all competition behind you in the dust. This seminar is about making you believe in yourself once again, forcing you to recall a time when you acted as though you had no limits to your abilities, when you leapt the chasm and landed victorious on the other side. More importantly, this seminar is about daring, fighting, and winning. I want to tell you at the outset, there is no success without risk, no fighting without action, and no winning without sacrifice. If you're not willing to dare to take offensive action and sacrifice many aspects of your normal life, then this seminar is not for you. I'm here to tell you, you cannot have it all. And any touchy-feely, silk-suited guru who tells you otherwise is just plain wrong. He's lying. But if you're willing to listen and learn, if you're prepared to avoid the company of morons and ignore conventional wisdom, if you will join with me and look the world straight in the eye, dare to stand in your way and take powerful, decisive action, then each and every one of you in this room can become successful and can become a high-performance individual. And please let me be clear at the outset what I mean by success. This is not some happy, clappy, feel-good, rah-rah rally. I'm not here for you to like me. Quite frankly, if you want a friend, buy a dog. I'm here to tell you how to load your pockets with so much money that you have to weigh it instead of count it. If I have to slap, kick, punch, drag you over the finish line, that's what I'll do. That's my task. That's my job. I'm going to make you very, very uncomfortable. I can sense the discomfort from here already. I'm going to call you names. Not as many as Barry thinks I'm going to call you, though. And sometimes act like a drill sergeant. 
I'll be up here doing whatever it takes to make you realize one thing. You've been too comfortable. You've plumped your sorry arse down on a comfy chair a long time ago and have all but forgotten the warrior you once were. My task is to get you out of that armchair and turn you into a lean, mean, fighting machine ready to take on the world, ready to make your quantum leap and ready to haul away cash in the tens of millions. I trust you will listen carefully to my message. This Quantum Leap Advantage seminar is broken into five sections. And we call it Quantum Leap Advantage because you follow these precepts and you will have an unfair advantage on the competition. The first section is, who am I? Why am I qualified to be here today? Section two is what I mean by super successful. And my definition of success is significantly different than definitions you've heard in the past. The third section is preparing you yourself for your own quantum leap. And we will go through what I call the 15 keys to super success. Section four is achieving, actually achieving your own quantum leap. And we will go through what I've determined as the eight power strategies for that end. And last but not least, section five is how you cash in on your quantum leap. How do you exit successfully? How do you put that money, that dosh, those shekels, whatever denomination, whatever, whatever currency you want to call it, in your pocket and how to do it again and again and again? Welcome to Quantum Leap Advantage. You are the elite here. You have a great responsibility. Don't let yourself get comfortable. And I will do everything in my power to make sure you don't. Don't make friends. Do commit unnatural acts. And do talk to the devil. And some of you will ascertain, if you haven't already, I am the devil today. You're not here to be comfortable. You're here to go beyond. Dr. Oppenheimer was the head of the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was the project to create a bomb of mass destruction to end the war in the Pacific. They were successful. I am qualified to be here because I have been dirt poor. Poorer than anybody in this room. I come from the ghettos of East Los Angeles. The barrio as it's called. Um, and when I make this, these kinds of talks in Spain and Latin countries, um, this is where they really get uncomfortable. This is my father. He was in the uh, Naval Air Force during World War II. Some people think he looks like a movie star. I can assure you when he was beating me as a young man, battering me, I didn't think he was a movie star. I thought he was the devil. By the time this picture was taken, I had been expelled from school five times. I was 10 years old. One time for dropping an aquarium on my teacher from what you would call the first floor window, which we would call the second floor window. But I missed him. I only hit him in the shoulder with the aquarium and it broke his collarbone as I did recently in a, in a sporting accident. By the time that picture was taken, I looked like a young little cherub only for the photograph, I can assure you. By the time that picture was taken, I was 16 and a half. I had been expelled a couple more times. And shortly after that picture was taken, the head of our school gave me my diploma and said, get off campus, Mr. Pena. We don't want your kind here because you're just going to disrupt graduation. And I did. And by the time this picture was taken, I was 21, had flunked out of university three times, and volunteered for the draft to go away to the Vietnam War. And those were my two best friends, and we, were, we enlisted on the buddy plan, where we were supposed to all go to the same post. One went to Fort Hood, Texas, one went to Chicago, and I went to California. So I learned very young that you can't trust the government. This was a turning point in my life. Quite by accident, I became an officer and went through OCS and learned discipline. And what most of you lack in this audience 
and in every audience I speak before is the discipline to be a high performance individual. And we will talk a great deal about that. As you can see, I certainly wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Some people in this audience were. But I'm not going to point you out, even though I know. I know there's life after death because I have been broke five times. And I've been in financial disarray as recently as 1993. As recently as 1993. I've been broker than you, but I know something you don't. I can make it again. I've made it five times. And Lord, I don't want to do it a sixth. But if push came to shove, I could do it a sixth. Because I know I made my money not by accident. And now I have sufficient mentees, protégés in the world that have been successful that now I'm at a stage in my life that I want to teach people how to coach. I made my first killing, so to speak, or I earned my guns selling property while I was in graduate school at UCLA many years ago, 1971 to be exact. And I learned then, as we'll talk about later today, you are who you hang around with. And in fact, I fired, sacked a room twice as big as this and started from scratch and hired people from Top Gun pilots that were being released from the Vietnam War and San Diego Air Station. And 13 of us sold more than 241 sold in one quarter the whole entire previous year. Now, many of you that have heard me speak before, and those of you that read the fine marketing piece at Stuart Goldsmith, and I want to take this opportunity of thanking him because he's brought me into the new century. Uh, I'm even not computer illiterate anymore, and we'll get around to that later. Because I turned $820 into $445 million in eight years, almost to the day, when the industry that I was part of went from natural resources, $42 oil, to less than $8 oil, and more than 10,000 energy companies alone in the United States went bust, and another six or 7,000 in Europe went bust during that same time frame. And I built and ran and founded, for five years in a row, the fastest growing natural resource company on the planet. and floated it here in London, on the London Stock Exchange. Some of you may have even been shareholders. And I'm sure some of the pension funds that your money's in were shareholders. And this was the board, or at least half of the board, of directors of that company, and that was in my office in Houston, Texas. And we'll talk about it a little later, but this is the same board that threw me out several years later after me making them all rich. And last night I had drinks with the, one of the founders of British Biotech, who you've probably read about. And he's gone from a net worth of 270 million pounds at 20 pounds a share to 16 pence a share. And you can figure it out, he's lost everything. From almost being knighted to the penthouse to the shithouse in less than a year. By the way, the gentleman in the gray hair on the left-hand corner, Robert Dyke, is the father of the North Sea. Found oil at Argyle in 79 and ostensibly, or theoretically, bailed out Great Britain from bankruptcy um, when Mrs. Thatcher first took over in the Tory government. The other gentleman just above him is the former treasurer of Royal Dutch Shell, a Scot named Bruce Patterson, and the rest that's not really important. You can tell who, where I'm sitting, though. Why am I here? Why do I have the credentials to talk to you about being a high-performance person? Well, we're just going to talk about a few of the milestones. One, I've taken $60,000 and turned it into $50 million dollars in three and a half months. I took an option public on the London Stock Exchange right here, not too many miles from here, when there had never been an option taken public. And the takeover panel and the yellow book and all the other rules and regulations says you can't do that, Dan. Nobody's ever taken an option for anything public. You have to own it. And I said, bollocks. I didn't know bollocks at the time. I didn't know whether it had one L or two Ls. I'm not sure I still know if it's got one or two. But I took it public in spite of the conventional wisdom. And there's a lot of conventional wisdom in the city. 
I forced one of the largest energy conglomerates in the world, a Canadian company, so it wasn't a fair fight because they're Canadians and Canadians managed by consensus, to sell their largest asset, Bow Valley USA, for $155 million when they didn't want to. For those of you that say, Dan, how do I buy a company when they don't want to sell? Well, you can. In this particular case, I used their own bank against them, Citicorp. And we bought the debt from Citicorp. And if you don't think your banks will sell your debt, you are naive and living in a dream world. And then I'm your banker. How many would like to have me as your banker? And more recently, in three years' time, from January 96 to February of this year, I took a company from a genesis of an idea, sitting in my living room in my estate in California, overlooking the Pacific Ocean, to a flotation a few months ago, and created from scratch a publishing company worth $120 million. And I made my partner, the CEO, David Reeker, who some of you know, worth about 35 or $40 million, and he's not 40 years old yet. As an aside, the family was barren, and he conceived the baby with his wife at Guthrie Castle. So not only did I make him rich, I made him a father. I think the ghost had something to do with that. And there's David Reeker on the left. Some people say he looks like my butler, but... And the, we were signing our first acquisition there at Guthrie, and that was the uh, gentleman we were acquiring, John Lindbergh on the right. He looks like the maitre d' at the Savoy. I think he is the maitre d' at the Savoy now. And why am I here? Why am I qualified? This is my home. This is my dream. And we're going to talk about wrapping your new vision around some passion, some dream. That was my dream. And it came to fruition many years ago, 1984, when I moved to Britain and I moved to Scotland and I've been a resident ever since and I pay UK taxes. And this is just a, a view. You can see my helicopter. You can see the shadow of my helicopter, actually just off the lower left-hand corner. And that's how I used to fly to Edinburgh Airport. And I used to sit right down next to the British Air Shuttle. And I trot on the plane. And you can do those kinds of things in this country. The fact that Lord King was a friend of mine at the time who was chairman of British Air probably helped matters. And there I am sitting out in front of the, my main gate, um, looking casual, getting ready to ride to the hounds, I think. And this is the sincere look my children know isn't true. This is the PR look, Dad. You never look like that. And that's my lovely wife, a photograph, excuse me, a photograph of a painting that stood in the uh, um, Royal Academy of Portrait Painters uh, in 1987, and it was done by, uh, theoretically, the greatest portrait painter alive today, a guy named Howard Morgan. He also did a painting of mine, of me, that made him famous. Why am I qualified? Well, let's look at the other side of that question or that statement. You, in your search for being a high-performance person or additional wealth, have listened to people that have made money by putting bums on seminar seats, selling books and tapes. They've made more money up here, as Barry said, than out in the real world. I've made all my money out there, and I have now decided to come out of retirement and talk and, and, as we will talk about in depth, change the way business information is disseminated on this planet. And if I can do it, coming from the background that I came from, then there's no doubt in my military or civilian mind that you can do it. One of my best friends who wasn't on that slide is Ruben Munoz, who's serving life for murder in Florida State Penitentiary. He would not believe, he does not believe the success that I've had because he knew me as a, as a child, as an adolescent. He can't begin to fathom how I've turned my life around and focused on being a high-performance person. The business success business is sick with diarrhea. Everybody understands diarrhea? Well, I am the Kelpectic, and Kelpectic is what you take to stop up diarrhea. In the Netherlands, they don't understand Kelpectic. Took me 20 minutes, so finally, I just don't use this slide in, in the Netherlands anymore. 
I made more money on one deal than all the silk-suited gurus in the industry. And my unique selling proposition is as follows. I've made more money than the entire industry cumulative since the beginning of time. And if you can find anybody that's made more money from scratch than I have, created more wealth, I will retire instantly. I will take you and your significant other to his next seminar, and I will pay for first class at a Ritz-Carlton equivalent and fly you there first class. I've had that unique selling proposition for six and a half years now, and nobody's ever called me, wrote me, emailed me, or faxed me. And none of the gurus have ever sued me because none of them have any money. Summary. I was a um, no-hope, wasted space. It's hard for me to say that about myself. In fact, it's almost impossible. I find it str my throat straining, but it's true. I flunked out of school. I got into a lot of trouble. I came from an impoverished background. If I had it harder, I've had it harder than most of you. And my father had to work three jobs for us to eat. His, jo his salary as a policeman when I was a little kid was $142 a month, about 80 quid a month, 20 quid a week. Believe me, I've been more broke than anybody in this room. Again, I didn't have a silver spoon. I came from nothing to make hundreds of millions and live on a grand estate, a 15th century storybook castle, Guthrie Castle in Guthrie, Scotland. In short, there's no doubt, if I can do it, you can do it, and that is my message. And we will move on. Now, money isn't everything. But quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, it's the only thing anybody keeps track of. People don't keep track of your brownie points when you do good things. They do keep track if you give money to charities, etc. And one of the things that we will discuss later on today is I have a lot more choices in life. Mr. Goldsmith has a lot more choices in life than you do, only because we have more money. I forget who said it, that, that um, the super rich aren't like you and me, uh, but they're not. And uh, things that I take for granted every day, you labor over. I told somebody here earlier this morning, my son started university this week. After getting out of school a year and a half early, and he's gone to pro posh prep school, private schools all his life. And now he's going to university, has 40,000 students. And he shows up with the other 4,000 first year freshmen, and all of his classes are oversubscribed. There's lines of six, seven, eight hundred people. And he's standing there. I can just see him now standing there, not knowing what to do. So he's had a, a dose of reality. Success does equal money because it's not the only measure of success, but it is, as I said a minute ago, the only one anybody keeps track of. Money can provide everything except health and love, and believe me, it enhances those two alternatives as well. Now, I'm sure we have... That one. I'm sure we have some placard, former placard carriers in the audience, and I'm going to tell a little story. A number of years ago, before apartheid was, was uh, stopped, in South Africa, I was going into the U.S. Embassy with a friend of mine, and uh, he said, I've seen some of these people carrying placards around out in front of the embassy, and I've seen them grow middle-aged. I've seen them go from adolescence to, uh, you know, their 30s and 40s. And I said, well, don't you get tired of driving through these same placard carriers day after day, John? He said, no, thank God they, they carry placards, Dan, because th th then we have nothing to worry about because they don't do anything. Well... Some of those people, God willing, Allah willing, whatever, became high performance people and now are doing something about apartheid and apartheid's ended. We are going to talk about you not being a placard carrier anymore, but actually being a person that takes action.
Most people who claim that money doesn't matter are broke morons, gutless free hu tree huggers, and touchy-feely New Age mystics. They have all opted out of the effort and discipline required to get wealthy. I have a theory that the hippie movement in the 60s was a cop-out for Americans didn't want to go to Vietnam and rather run to Canada and protest. I have a theory about that, which we're not going to talk about, but I have a theory. And um, well, I don't want to make any political statements about my president right now. I could talk all day about that. Having met the gentleman, I've met six, five presidents in my life, and he was the least likely one to be president. There are no high-performance, touchy-feely people. There just aren't any. Now, I've been blessed, and we're going to talk about mentors later, uh, to have three of the great businessmen in the world as mentors over the years. And um, they've told me, uh, one of which was Constantine Grazos, the CEO of NASA Shipping Lines, the right-hand man of Aristotle and NASA for over 60 years. And he says, you always hear about these, and he didn't use words like this, but touchy-feely people, Mr. Pena. He never called me down. He said, but I've never met one. Mr. Onassis and I never met one. We hear about them, you read about them, but I've never met one. Maybe in your lifetime you'll meet one. Well, I'm 54 years old, and I'm still looking for one. Maybe one of you will prove me wrong. Please, my email is danpena.com. Drop me a line if you can find one. Seek and destroy. That's the way it should be. But now it's become a fellowship, hugging each other. This ain't, warm and, uh, ain't a warm and fuzzy thing. The rules used to be simple. You lose, you die. This was a commentator on the fifth big network in America. On the way here, my cab driver said, this is a, a guy that would give the Americans a run for his money. And I said, well, who lives there? He says, Richard Branson. I said, yeah. And I, I said, yeah. And he says, Bill Gates is buying a house right down the street from him, which I didn't know either. And he told me, he says, where are you going? And I told him the Renaissance. He said, oh, I've, I brought a ride in here last night. I said, yeah? He said, yeah. Um, a British businessman, entrepreneur, is going to get battered by an American tomorrow or today. I said, yeah? I said, what do you mean? He says, yeah, he's going to get a bollocking from some American to tell him what a weak uh, four-letter word he is. And uh, I said, well, I'm that American. He said, really? And then he kept on talking and telling me about his dad who bought one pub and then two pubs and three pubs and four pubs, etc. And now he owns 19 pubs. He sold it to white, white bread, I think he told me. And, uh, but he's driving a cab. So I had to ask the question, why are you driving a cab? Oh, he says, well, I inherited all that money. I like to talk to people all day. I said, well, that's wonderful. I'm sure you makes your father proud. <laughs> They train with the intensity of war. That's why war has little effect on them. Roman Legion, Command, Roman Legion commander, circa 200 BC. High performance people practice, practice, practice. They practice being high performance people. And as we get on to the presentation later on today, you are who you hang around with. And that's how you'll be measured. And if you hang around with non-high performance people, guess what? And if you think money can't buy happiness, you don't know where to shop. That's a Linda Penyism, my wife, as told to the Financial Times by some 23-year-old girl at that time was making 12, 13,000 pounds a year, wanted to know if my wife was really happy. And it's hard for me to say this without laughing. And so my wife took the patients, and they, they were in Hyde Park, and they were taking photographs of her. She sat down on this bench, and for two hours, my wife explained to her that she was happy, and that, you know, contrary to what poor people think, that rich people are very happy. <laughs> and I, what I would have said was, my worst day, sweetheart, love, my worst day is better than your best day. You notice how I didn't use the four-letter word, I just... I'm, so, I'm getting so good, I can't believe it. I'm trying to clean up my act for the new millennium. I have to make a speech next year uh, to, uh, in Germany, some big economic council, uh, and uh, they don't like the F word and the C word and all those words that I normally use, so I'm practicing as we lead up to the new millennium. As soon as I make that speech, though, I'm going right back. I'm not changing that much. You don't want to be broke in the first two decades in the new millennium, believe me. 
Believe it. I mean, you don't want to be broke any time. But you are now part of the largest buying unit on the planet, about 365 million people. Competition is going to be extraordinary in the new millennium. And you're going to see that some of the business practices that got you to where you are today in 1999 aren't going to work in the year 2000 moving forward. There are not enough young people to support the old, and so state benefits will not be worth having in the new millennium. In America, they're not worth having now. Hopefully, this is your wake-up call. Now, a few of you I've seen two or three times, um, and um, it's like I'm the chairman of International Media Holding, a public company in America, and I make speeches uh, for the holding company, and there's a, one guy that attends all my talks, and I asked him three and a half years ago if he had used any of the stuff that had, he had learned, and he said no, and I saw him about four or five months ago, and I asked him again, and some people um, are groupies, so to speak, that just want to hear and think it's important to at least expose themselves to others' opinions, although they have blinders on and they're never going to adapt to change. And we're going to talk a lot about change. But God willing, this is your wake-up call. Achieving a quantum leap now means having so much money you can't count it, you have to weigh it. Now that seems absurd. That seems unreasonable. Well, I was Bunker Hunt's partner when he captured silver, or almost captured the silver market 20 years ago. And I still remember him saying, uh, he said, some real gaffes at this press conference we called. He said, uh, how rich are you? He was asked, how rich are you, Mr. Hunt? He says, I don't really know. If you, if you know how much money you've got, you can't have too much money. Uh, and I believe that. Um, I haven't written a check since 1981 or 82. I still carried an old Bank of Scotland crumpled up check. Check number one from my checking account at the Bank of Scotland up in, up in Scotland. And um, there's a lot of things, as my children would tell you. I bought gasoline from a pump with a credit card for the first time last year. I'd never done that before. And my children were quite proud of me. that I knew how to get the credit card in the machine and could find the gas tank. There are certain things you don't do if you have a lot of money. I just recently learned how to drive again because I had a car and a driver for a long, long, long time, and I decided that in my 50s I should be able to drive myself around. Now, see, these are different things that you have to worry about, right? Well, this is a good thing. The quantum leap is a move you're already prepared to make. You just haven't done it. Every single man, woman, and child in this room is capable of that leap. And when we talk about later on after the break, the steps the power strategies, etc., you're going to think back, well, I've heard that before. You will hear nothing new here. It will just be spit out differently in a louder voice with more conviction from somebody that has actually done it. As they say in Texas, if you want to hunt with the big dogs and pee in the tall grass. Now, during the break, or maybe uh, I'll explain what that all means, but this is... Um, Analogous to during the oil boom when oil was $40 a barrel and people would ask oil barons that had gone from being roughneck daily workers in the field to multimillionaires because of the price of oil. They used to say, you build it and we'll buy it. And if you want to hunt with the big dogs, the big dogs in this country are gentlemen like Mr. Branson, who's been very successful, dropped out of school. You know his story better than I do. One of the great branding entrepreneurs this planet has ever seen, the Virgin brand. Didn't go to any of the great schools, did he? Did it? If there's anybody against conventional wisdom on this planet, it's Branson. Yet how many Bransons do we have in this country? Not too many. Actually, we only have one Branson in this country. I, I, I stand corrected. That didn't sound right. Of the 300, it's about 365 billionaires. We've had a couple of other internet stocks go public in the last few days. There's about 365, 370 billionaires on the planet. And their wealth and assets exceed the combined annual income of nearly 50% of the people on the planet. That's staggering. 
That's staggering. And many of those internet people are here in Europe. And I know not, you don't have part of the currency and all that, but the rest of the world considers this Europe. I know that's hard for the, the Britons to believe, but the rest of the world be believes this is Europe. Living here, I know it's not. But when I go across the, uh, the channel in the, the Netherlands, where I have a lot of business interests, um, you know, I talk about Great Britain being Europe. One of the questions that I ask in the first half of today, and I tell and scream in the second half of today, is are you willing to release the beast? What does that mean? Are you willing to make the change? Are you willing to look life at life differently? People do big changes for two reasons. Desperation and inspiration, ladies and gentlemen. Which line, which cue do you fall into? Are you desperate? Are you inspired? The gentleman that I had drinks with last night, one of the three founders of British Biotech, and I... Um, who went from almost knighthood to down the pan in a short period of time. And I, there's three, and I, that's why I don't mention the name, because there's three, but you've all read about it in the newspapers, um, is a stronger person today because, you know, tall trees experience strong winds, and I'm sure that he will come back and he will do another great entrepreneurial thing, uh, and I'm looking forward to it, and I may even be part of it. Um, but if you expect not to experience turbulence, as you grow as an individual, then you're not living in the real world. At no time in our history is change more rampant. Internet and, and cyberspace and all those things are changing our life by the minute, not by the day or the week, by the minute. And it will make life more difficult for you if you don't change. And it will make life more easy for you if you do. I am a high performance person because I have an exceptional, extraordinary emotional bank account. Not because I have an exceptional, extraordinary financial bank account. These two bank accounts we have in life are directly related. People that succeed at a high level, that are high performance, deal with adversity better than you. There's an interesting book called The Adversity Quotient, which I happen to like. I believe it's by Dr. Paul Stoltz, where he dictates or he says time and time again, and example after example, people that have undergone great stress and learn how to deal with that stress the best are able to succeed at a very, very high level because they realize that these things aren't life-threatening. You will run low on your emotional bank account way before you run out of money. This country, European countries have different culture. And you're taught in a different way. That is, in some cases, a hurdle. Now, I don't know how British Mr. Branson thinks he is. I don't know. I've met him, but I've never talked to him about that. But I'm sure he doesn't think he's as British as the Queen... One of the reasons that I moved here was because of the fact that you look at life differently in, in, in Britain. Um, and one of the reasons I made a lot of money here is because you look at life different in Britain. But the city and the country and Europe is getting, I don't like to use more Americanized, but it's getting more um, economic in their viewpoints of how they do business. I want you to be committed to do what it takes in order to have what you want. I am currently working on one project that I've been involved in 11 years. This is my 12th year, actually. And I'm fighting one of the, one of the Fortune 50 companies, a big chemical company uh, with a patent, and it's a long story. 
but I'm committed. I'm the only original guy in the deal in the 12th year. I'm the only guy because all the other men and women have decided it's not worth it. It's not worth the hassle. It's not worth the toil. Uh, but I'm committed to win. The other companies spent about 125 to $150 million keeping me out of a certain business. And I've spent $4.5 million of my own money plus about another six or seven million of various other people's money, um, making sure that I stay in long enough to be in the business. Now everybody's gone, and I bought out everybody for pennies on the pound, or pence on the pound, and now we are going to get a new patent, because our patent expires a year from July, last July. Now we're going to get a new patent, and the big company's going to have to buy me out. And I would gladly have shared this money with all my other partners, but they're all gone now. Because they weren't committed to go to the end. High performance people have commitment as one of their strongest characters. Characteristics, excuse me. How committed are you? Unfortunately, most men and women lead quiet lives of desperation. I can't imagine what it would be like to get up in the morning and not enjoy what you're doing. Why do Europeans spend three to six weeks on holiday when the average American spends 2.1 week on holiday? Because you don't like what you're doing. That's why. And if you think it's any other reason, you're living in a dream world. Success leaves clues. I'm up here because I've been successful at a very high level. When we talk about how high-performance people train themselves to be high-performance individuals, well, success leaves clues. One of the clues is and as we'll talk about later, is I only deal with high-performance individuals. How can a lawyer, a solicitor that makes 50,000 pounds a year, for example, although I just heard they're crossing over the million pound, the senior partners in the big firms this morning on the news, BBC. I love BBC. They had a great deal about elephants uh, a few nights ago, and a poor elephant got her, her hoof amputated. She's a famous elephant at one of the big zoos. And... BBC did a two-hour special on something you could have talked about in ten minutes. That's what I love about BBC. They don't give a damn what it costs. I mean, I knew more about elephants. They got the same cardiovascular problems, except they don't suffer from, uh, you know, heart attack. I mean, it's unbelievable what I know about elephants. Just like Open University. If they had had Open University where I went to school, I would have sat and drinking beer all day and watched Open University got a degree. I mean, that's what's great about this country. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, this country ruled two-thirds of the world at one time. Correct? Two-thirds. What happened? But remember, there's a very small step from the limo to the gutter. And it's a very big step from the gutter to the limo. Dedication perseverance, discipline. And we talk more about it all day long. But those are just some of the characteristics of high-performance individuals. How else could it be? Why would I take the time to share what I know with you? I don't need the money. Stewart doesn't need the money unless something went wrong since I last talked to him. Why? I have the luxury of telling you exactly how it is because for that very reason, I don't need the money. I enjoy this. Where else can you get paid, uh, a tuppence really, but get paid and be able to batter people around? I mean, where else? Now, these are just some of the advantages of being wealthy. There's a whole heck of a lot more, believe me. 
Your choices are infinite. For those of you that don't understand the word infinite, we have a deck dictionary in the back you can look at in the break. You can do anything you want when you want. See, you plan your holidays. Everybody, not everybody in this room, that's, that's a cavalier of me. Most of you in this room plan your holidays out a, a good distance. One, because it's cheaper and I can come up with all kinds of reasons. You know when I plan my holiday? Well, first of all, I don't take holidays. But when I'm going to join my family while they're on holiday... I got a half day break. Somebody canceled, a plane didn't make it to the airport. I jump on a plane, I meet my family there for two, three days, and I come back. I'm certainly not able to buy tickets cheaply there. that way, am I? I don't know anybody that's a high performance person that plans holidays. I only planned one holiday, and I wish I had never gone. I went on the Love Boat, the largest uh, suite on the Love Boat. Uh, through the Caribbean, up the Amazon, I don't know, three weeks. We had canceled the trip three or four or five times, and I, I, I didn't want to go. Just a bunch of old you know, people on boats. I don't want to go. Anyway, so I went, and um, I found out the guy that had the suite across from me had six square feet less than my suite, paid one-fifth of what I paid, and I paid for it four years before. I didn't realize if you wait till the last minute, you can get these things for nothing. And as soon as I found that out, I was very upset. And the, the, the cruise started. We had, they put 10 people at a table, five couples. By the third night, my wife and I were sitting alone at our table. Shocking, actually. I couldn't believe it. My wife says, Dan, can't you be nice to somebody so we could at least have somebody to talk to during uh, dinner? I says, no. Basically, I said, I said, fuck them. I don't care. <laughs> You have real personal power. What do I mean by that? Personal power is I, I can say what I really believe and what I really know that works to you, whether it makes you uncomfortable or not. And in the recent publication of my new book that, the, uh, that uh, Stuart published for me, I mean, I tell it just how it is. I don't pull any punches. It's bloody hard to do what I've done, but it's not impossible. But you've got to be dedicated. And you can take care of others, children, parents, selected friends. You've got choices again. I was talking to my mother who's almost 80. She's selling my house that she lives in and she's going to move. We got an offer. It's acceptable. It hasn't even cleared escrow 45 days. And so I get a voicemail that she says, I'm worried about being homeless. And I, and I talked to her and it's very, it's, it's a hard, it's a struggle for me to talk to my almost 80 year old mother. And I said, my, you're not going to be homeless. She said, well, how am I going to move everything? What am I going to do with the car? And I said, you know what we're going to do? I'm sending my staff over. We're going to drag all your stuff out, and we're going to make a big bonfire. And we're going to burn every damn thing you own so you don't have to worry about moving it. And then when the fire's really roaring, I'm going to pull in your new Cadillac and burn the shit out of it, too. And then you won't have problems. Now, the cab driver who's driving me, he's, he's thinking to himself, he's giving his mom a real go, my God. And I said, this cab driver feels sorry for you, Mom, so I'm going to give him the phone and you can cry to him. And she says, oh, you're just teasing me, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I'm just teasing you. You can take care of others, and that's fun to be able to do that. It's fun to be able to do it and not have to do it. That's the difference. Some of you feel obligated that you have to. And some of you that feel obligated that you have to don't have the means to do it. And especially in this country... Some of the most respected families in this country are the oldest and most wealthy families in this country. Why? Some of them did great things. Most of them haven't. In my part of the world where I live, you go to University of Edinburgh, Oxford, Cambridge, you come back, you go into the Black Watch, which is a regiment. I don't even know if the Black Watch is still around. For four or five years, you come out, you go to the city, you work for uh, a merchant bank, for two or three years, you come back and you drink yourself to death. And they've been doing that for several hundred years. That's, that's where I live, in Scotland. And it's not going to change. And I'm certainly not going to change it. They're waiting, they're waiting for me to drink myself to death up there. So I can quit talking about them. I've said that. I had my 50th birthday at Glom's Castle. Queen Mum's home... 
Lady Strathmore, uh, Lord Strathmore. She's the lady in waiting to the Queen Mum. I don't know how many, she's been lady in waiting about 80 years, I think. And I don't exactly know what the lady in waiting does. But I know the lady, lady Strathmore, now the young Strathmores are there. And they said that I couldn't rent the Queen Mum's place for my 50th birthday. And I said, oh yeah, I can. And they said, no, you can't. Well, to make a long story short, I did. And you know where I'm going to have my 60th? Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and if you don't think so, live six more years. And especially now they need the dosh. <laughs> I said this before that, though. Now they need the dosh. Her, you know. Lord grant that I may always desire more than I can accomplish. One of the things we talk about after lunch, very briefly, is goal setting. And one of the things that changed my life was I heard, when I heard Ted Turner, the mouth from the south, as he's affectionately called in Georgia, um, say that my dad left me two things when my dad committed suicide back in the early 60s. He left me a $2 million billboard business, an advertising company, and uh, the idea to set goals that transcend my lifetime. When I heard that, ladies and gentlemen, a few years ago, on the dais at the Harvard Club with, with Mr. Turner, changed my life. Because I had accomplished everything I wanted to by the time I was 39, and I retired to Guthrie. And, um, and I now realize that I would have been more fulfilled if I had set goals that I couldn't accomplish in my lifetime. And all the high-performance people have such goals. Now, this next section is how do you prepare for your quantum leap? Now, we're going on the assumption that everybody's here to at least consider a quantum leap. We're not going on the assumption that you're all lazy, satiated, over the hill, dead broke, Brits. So we're giving everybody in the room the benefit of the doubt. By the way, when I'm in the Netherlands, I don't give them the benefit of the doubt. Because if there's anybody, because I tell them, you used to run, control 40% of the world, which they did. And we go through this, and I have a whole speech that I give at Nairobi University, which I'm on part, part of the staff, as Holland isn't heaven. Now this, you can just imagine how this goes over. When I'm at Unilever, Royal Dutch Shell, or whatever, Holland isn't heaven. But, so I'm actually nicer to the Brits. That's because I live here. Okay. You only have a first one time to make a first impression. So we're going to talk about how you groom yourself to be a high performance individual. And we're going to talk about from the way you dress, to the way you talk, to the way you act, and more importantly, the way you are perceived. Because perception is reality. If I was up here with an earring in my ear, a green mohawk across the top of my head, which I get a chill just even saying that, let alone. Um, and I, I, some other bizarre attire. It's not likely that, well, unless I'm a rock star or something, I mean, it's not likely anybody's going to listen to me and pay attention to what I have to say about business. And they shouldn't. They shouldn't. You know, Richard Branson wears a Nike or Reebok running suits, or maybe it's Virgin. I don't know if he makes the clothes like that. When you get to be Richard Branson, you can dress that way. But everybody that reports to Richard Branson is dressed in business attire. And one of the reasons that uh, I believe the invitation required business attire uh, was because we want you to think like a business person. Now, see, I used to say businessman, but I'm getting ready for the new millennium. And I realized that there are a few high-performance women, not many, but a few. Now, we're going to talk about the 15 keys to super success. First, being a high-performance, super successful person is by no means for everybody, full stop, period. And anybody that tells you any different is either sick or lying to you because they're trying to sell something to you. Now, I, I see one surgeon near the front row, who I, 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 so I'm going to make a doctor analogy. Not everybody can go to medical school. 
As stupid as doctors are in investment, I can't imagine why everybody can't go to medical school. But I know for a fact it's difficult to get into medical school, especially the better ones. Because they don't want every rufus doofus, you know, uh, cutting on you and doing the stuff that they do. Because it's, it's, it takes a high level of, uh, of training, practice, education, etc. So medical school isn't for everybody. Even if we all applied ourselves, a lot of us couldn't. I'm not, I say us in the royal us because I know I could if I had gone. But anyway, a lot of you couldn't have made it through medical school. This is no different than this. This is not for everybody. Just as public speaking isn't for everybody. Realizing this will save you thousands in books, tapes, and seminars. And I've had people come through the program over the last six and a half years that I've done this that have spent as much as 73000 in one year on seminars, books, and tapes. 73000 Part of this key is, and I've already alluded to it, it is extremely difficult to do what I'm talking about. But the difference is, I say it's difficult, other people tell you it's easy, and the other people haven't done it. But it's not impossible. What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to sacrifice to be a high-performance individual? Some of you, not, nothing. Some of you take more time planning your holidays than you do the future, your future or your life. I know my wife and I plan for our three children about university. Now that we've actually got one in university, and he tricked us. He wasn't supposed to graduate till June of 2000, and he came to me in February this year, and he said, Dad, I'm tired of school. I don't want to go to school anymore. I'm smarter than all the teachers. I said, well, this is part of life, Dan. We're smarter than most people. And he said, uh, but I don't want to. I'm going to drop out of school. I said, no, you're not, Dan. You're not dropping out of anything. If you drop out of school, I'm going to drop you in a grave someplace. And so uh, I said, but if you can come up with a way to get out of university without embarrassing me, your mother, the family, and that's legal, that costs me nothing, I'll consider it. Three and a half weeks later, when I know when my son picks me up at the airport, it's something catastrophic, you know. Either the worst thing happened, there's a big death in the family, or he's got a big deal to sell me. He picks me up at the airport, he's driving me home, and he says, um, I came up with a way. To make a long story short, he got out of school in 1st of April, of course, trying to get into a university, I underestimated that because I had forgotten that you apply a year before, a year and a half before. And so that was a whole other big challenge, getting him into a school, which we did finally. But um, all the planning we've done uh, and all the schools that we had gotten him accepted to for the year 2000 went down the pan because he decides to get out of school a year and a quarter early. So man plans, God laughs. But it's tough, no matter... How hard you plan, it's still tough as hell to do what I'm saying and I would be less than candid and I would be lying to you if I said any different. Because everybody has a fear of responsibilities and expectations that come with success. Some of you, and I say this generically to all audiences, some of you are more afraid of success than you are failure or are being average as you are now. Why? Well, as I said in my opening comments, You've got to keep doing it. What are people going to say? Was I just lucky the first time? Can I repeat? What if I lose it all? These are questions that you ask yourself, if not at a conscious level, for sure at a subconscious level. Because you are afraid. It's the same reason you don't, if you're a, you play to a 15 handicap in golf, why you'd be apprehensive to play with Nick Faldo or Jack Nicholas in his prime or Tiger Woods. You'd be afraid of embarrassing yourself. For those of you that play tennis, we can go through a tennis analogy. In sports, sports metaphors are more readily understood. I used to use sex metaphors before I got myself cleaned up for the new millennium because I assumed Everybody understood sex. Believe me, I've done this long enough now that that's a big assumption that I shouldn't make.
Conscious choice is a wonderful thing. It's like the holy grail of therapy. One man came up to me recently and he said, Mr. Pena, I'm, I'm glad that I came here. I'm glad that I understand what it takes and now I know it's not for me. If you fall into that category, you ought to kiss Stuart Goldsmith's backside and say, thank you very much, Mr. Goldsmith, for allowing me to understand that this isn't for me and I don't have to flog myself anymore. I don't have to come to s seminars. I don't have to buy tapes, but I still have to subscribe to his newsletter. <laughs> I've had people do that. I had a recent partner, a Dutch partner. We were in the insurance business together. We were buying uh, small insurance companies. He's 34 years old. He said, I can't take it anymore. And we sold off the assets. And, and then just recently, after two years, I have some other partners in Holland that I continued the business with. He approached him and said, you know, I really think that I do want to do it because he missed the rush of doing it. And he's certainly still young enough. Everybody in this room is still young enough, no matter how old you are. And there are a few people in this room that are older than me. Um, but you still have another bang, so to speak, in you. There comes a time in everybody's life. Some of us have already passed that time and some of us have experienced it more than once. You got to face the tiger. Is super success your tiger? Do you want to st stand in the eye of the hurricane? Some of you, the answer is yes. I hear all the time, boy, I wish I met you 20 years ago. I, li I, I, I like to smack those people. And I will today, I'm just in the mood. Because I see a couple of the old farts saying, oh yeah, I wish I could do it. Idiots. Key number two, I've never met a part-time high-performance person, ever. It's a full-time job. Getting wealthy is a full-time job. And anybody that says that you can do it part-time is not, is, first of all, it hasn't been there, done that. When I had the privilege of working with Mr. Grazos of Onassa Shipping Lines, I mean... It was a full-time job, not just running Onassis shipping lines after Mr. Onassis died, but I mean being a high-performance person. Everything he did, everything about him was at the very highest level. From the way he ate, the way he dressed, the way he looked, uh, I mean, uh, the f everything about him. I never saw him without his coat buttoned. I never saw him without a tie. Or he had a uh, silk smoking jacket, I think it's called. Um, he was a true renaissance man. And uh, I was fortunate, I was blessed to be around him for a number of years. Part of this key, birthdays, anniversaries, and holidays are for poor people. Wealthy people, high performance people, as I already mentioned, don't plan their holidays. They take it when they've got a break. They take it when they've got a break. I have been home for three of my birthdays in the last 15 years. My 40th birthday, we had several hundred people black tie party. My 50th birthday, I had several hundred people black tie party. And last birthday, I happened to be home. My wife said, you must have made a mistake in scheduling. Why are you here today? I go, what's today? Today's your birthday. Just August 10th passed. I'll be damned. Yeah, and uh, the birthday cards my children gave me all said about the same thing. We know you love us in your own way. I'm t and I carry them in my briefcase. We know you love us in your own way and you've always been there for us and, you and you'll continue to be there to pick us up when we fall as you have. I have a good buddy of mine who's a psychiatrist and I said... Uh, Carlo, what's this mean? He says, Dan, you know what it means. Don't give me that crap. You're not, you're not talking to those doofuses in the seminar here. You're talking to me. And I said, oh. And I says, um, it's, but he says, Dan, it's interesting that all three of them said the same thing. Ah, it's bullshit. Okay, I'll meet you for dinner a couple of days. And I just forgot about it. Um, be prepared to pay the price for super success or abandon your quest now, today. For everything in life, whether it's having a cup of coffee at the Ritz, to buying a drink at the Savoy, to taking a cab here has a price. 
Why is it so difficult for you to understand that there's a price for high performance activity? Why? Nick Faldo's hit six, seven million golf balls, maybe eight million by now. And he's at the twilight of his career. But in his prime, that price was, and I don't know if he lost his first wife because of his golfing career, I probably did, uh, um, or divorced his first wife. I, I, I don't mean lose in the sense of going to the big golf course in the sky. Um, but there's a price. There's an absolute price. Yet it's so difficult for people to understand. Key number three. Categorically, by definition, you can read my lips. You cannot have it all. Full stop. No way, Jose. Can you have it all? By all? Oh, I want to do everything and not have anxiety and not have pressure and don't get ulcers and you know, do everything I, you know, all, all the things that I want to do and none of the hard things and be lovey-dovey, you know, slappy-clappy. Well, that's all baloney. You can't do that. It's not possible. Because everything has a pay price to action. Every single thing has a pay price to action. You have a pay price to action for being here. Forget the money you paid, as little as it was. You have to listen to me or get up and leave. That's your pay price. I'm making a lot of people uncomfortable. I call it the pucker factor. When you start breathing through your rectum. See, the people that are getting up aren't getting up to go to the loo. No, they're not. They're getting up to go throw up. Because I've hit a raw nerve ending. There's a steep, pay, steep price to pay for success, and successful people in business know that. Doing the things I've done has not come easy. There's been a lot of sacrifice. This is one of Sam Walton's, Wal, you know, Walmart founder, mentees, a guy named Kent Sutherland, a very successful businessman in Arkansas, who Sam Walton took under his arm, or under his wing, so to speak, uh, in the last five or eight years of his life, and now goes runs around the country, around the world, talking about Waltonisms. And let me just give you one of Sam Walton's credos for success. It's called the sundown rule. And this is great talking to a group like you because I know none of you do it. And the sundown rule doesn't mean you have a drink by sundown, you lazy. Sundown rule means every single inquiry, email, phone message, fax that you receive in a given business day has to be returned in some shape, former manner, by sundown the day you get it. If nothing more than your PA calls up, Mr. Goldsmith received the message, we are following up, we will get back to you, not in due course, like you say, because due course means sometime between now and never. We will get back to you in the next 48 or 72 hours. Now, my sundown rule is by the time I go to sleep, I clear all my messages. Because I travel a lot when I get back to the hotel, I mean, I'll probably have 50 fax messages and I answer them all by the time I go to sleep. That's my sundown rule. You will be absolutely amazed and dumbfounded how much more you get done in a week. The corollary to that is the British in due course rule. Yeah, well, actually, I was thinking of answering that, but I'm planning my holidays. The only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. High performance people all work to excess. I have taken one full day off since 1971. One full day. I worked part of my 40th birthday, but I didn't work any of my 50th birthday. I decided when you're half a century old, I decided not to work at all. I also played in a golf tournament, my own golf tournament, my own golf course. And so I didn't really have time. And by the way, there's a solicitor in the city. He works for uh, Gouldens. He had not taken a day off, uh, one day off since 1972. And I heard about him and he heard about me. And we had breakfast a couple years ago. 
He was one of Maxwell's lawyers, got off the Maxwell kids. And I had to meet him. He works, he lives in uh, Eaton Square, and he had just bought his five-story place in Eaton Square from the Duke of Westminster for 12 million pounds. And we had breakfast, and he said, oh, I was really wanting to see what you really were like in person. And I said, well, the same, that's why I'm here. And we talked, we chatted for a couple hours. Um, and he was also the highest paid solicitor about five years ago in Great Britain. Took a real slagging from the press. He made 6.5 million pounds. And he just got beat up, which that's a whole other story. That's a cultural thing. Key number four, you've got to change. There's nobody in this room that has a, it, that has at a stage in life that change is not warranted. By definition, going into the next millennium, you have to. And we already know the reason we don't change is because of ourselves. Nobody keeps us from changing. We can chalk it up to our wife, our kids, our in-laws, or whoever, but it's you. It's you. And one of the things that high-performance people do is they take full responsibility. All the things I screw up, I say, I screwed up. I don't blame them on someone else. All people are self-made, but only successful people talk about it. The biggest loser in the audience is self-made. If you want super success, you must do the changing now. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Golfing metaphor. If you slice the ball, it's because you're hitting it from outside in. And you're putting this, a, a, a right to left spin on the ball and the, the ball goes off to the right. You can hit 25 million golf balls. If your path of the club head is outside in, you will slice the ball for eternity. I don't care how many times you play golf a day, a week, or how many golf balls. You're doing the same thing, and, but you're expecting different results. More of the same will just give you more of the same. We are now getting into my favorite perfectionist paralysis section of my talk. And first of all, the last perfect, and I don't mean to be sacrilegious or anything when I say this, the last close to perfect person that lived, you know what we did to him. I mean... A lot of us worship him at Easter and Christmas and we look at him up on the cross. First of all, it's not achievable and it's certainly not achievable by anybody in this audience. Nor myself or anybody else I know of or ever read of. And as we say, anything worth doing is worth doing badly at first. How do we start off in every sport that we know? How do we start off riding a bicycle on trainer wheels? As soon as the trainer wheels are off, we fall over on our big head. Everything in life we realize we have to do it poorly first. Why is it any different in business then? Why is it any different in life that we should expect different results? We all know when we start something for the first time, it's not going to be that great. Very few of us go out and play par golf the first time we're ever on a golf course. In fact, I don't know anybody that ever has. Most successful people do it poorly until they learn how to do it well. Just keep blundering. You cannot wait until it's exactly right. As General Patton said during World War II, I think the Battle of the Bulge, he said, um, I'd rather have a, okay, a good plan executed today than a great plan executed next week. But what will they say about you? What will my colleagues say? What will they say? How many members of the Reform Club do we have here? None. Okay, what will they say at the Reform Club? Which I just had drinks, actually, with my English publishing partner. And he was telling me he's got a triple-barreled name. I'm not going to mention his name. And he's talking about Willie, my Uncle Willie. He was talking about William the Conqueror. His family goes back 900 and some odd years for the first part of his triple barrel name, 700 years for the second part, and only 240 years for the third part. 
And he said, he told me the story, he says, when I was, he's been in boarding school since he's three. He's exactly my age, one day older than I am. And he said, I got a real battering from my father. I wrote home and I misspelled our surname, our second surname, and he, and he wouldn't let me come home for the holidays. He was five years old. And you wonder why you are the way you are. And he wasn't mad at his dad for doing that. I wouldn't even do that. I'm pretty hard on my kids. And he says, probably this is the first time in 750 years anybody's misspelled our surname. Actually. Actually, when you're through changing, you're through. According to Malcolm Forbes, has a lovely home. His estate has a lovely home near Cadogan Square. I've stayed in it. Um, and truly, when you are through changing, you're through. And that's why people that continue to work, live longer, keep their minds active because they're changing. They're having to adapt to the, the intricacies of life, the nuances. And ladies and gentlemen, believe me, the pace of change is accelerating beyond your wildest imagination. Quantumly, it's accelerating. And it's going to get faster and faster as we go into the new millennium. Change is a constant factor in the world today. Change has become the norm, not the exception. Management of change is the most important challenge we all face. Nelly Kuros, she's the president of Nairobi University, which is uh, the, the Harvard of the Benelux countries. Uh, and I'm proud to say a school that I have a very close association with um, and uh, had worked a lot with over the last three or four years. I was one of the keynote speakers at their 50th anniversary uh, a couple years ago. Mr. Gates was the opening keynote speaker and I was the closing keynote speaker. And, um, the, um, and the whole graduate school program, the MBA program, is based around change. Is based around change. In the next millennium, the average teenager today will have five different careers, not jobs, careers, in the course of his or her lifetime. Five. It's actually five to seven. Just think about that. It's staggering. When American Telephone and Telegraph decided to cut 40,000 jobs recently, tells a tale, the implied social contract, work hard, be loyal, move up, is extinct and gone forever. The big bucks will go to those who can adapt and change rapidly. If you cannot adapt, you will be swept away by the tidal wave of change. And that's what the new millennium is about. You will adapt or you will perish, according to Charles Darwin. Even now, I am becoming computer literate. Just in the last few weeks. Uh, because I'm making this big talk next year for the new millennium, um, I want to, I, I felt I can't go into this thing without knowing something about computers. I just, I mean, I talk about change up here and I'm the great Neanderthal of computer illiteracy. And so my son, uh, about six or eight weeks ago, sat me down in front of his, uh, uh, actually his mother's, computer in her office, and she says, it took him about 10, 12 minutes to teach me how to do it. And I said, this is really easy. And then he looked at me as only a Dan Pena Jr. could, and he said, Dad, anything 159, 160 million people can do on this earth, it's got to be easy. <laughs> anything that's growing at 60,000 a day, people on the internet, it's got to be easy. What do you think? These people are stupid out there, Dad. And I thought about it, not exactly how the people want to think of themselves that are on the, on the net, I would suspect. But it is true. It can't be difficult. 160 million people on the planet do it. It's like sex. Everybody's going to know how to do it. And what kind of change are we talking about? We're talking about a small shift of effort now, today, creates a large change years, a decade down the road. A small shift in aim with a weapon causes a huge difference. You move one inch with a rifle at the rifle end, how much does it move, or how much does it move the bullet where it lands in the target area? Depending on how far the target is. Inches, feet, yards, hundreds of yards, thousands of meters, miles. This is an American Sports analogy, metaphor. 
In American baseball, a guy that hits the 250, 250 averages, he's hitting the ball two and a half times after every 10 at bat. He gets paid about $600,000 a year, more or less. A man that hits three and a half times every time he's at bat, 10 times at bat, makes between 10 and $15 million. That's one hit per 10. <coughs> That's a very small difference for a huge economic benefit. And it's no different. <coughs> I want you to consider 10% change in your life. It's the important 10. It's also, ladies and gentlemen, and I would be less than candid with you if I told you, it's the hard 10%. When we start talking about the people that you surround yourself with, your friends, your mates, it's the hard 10 now, one of my favorite examples is George and Deanne. That says Dean. It should be Deanne Verdeer. They heard me speak in 1993, November 1993, at a chief executive club outing in, in Las Vegas. Um, they were they had a business that I don't know was three, four, five million dollar business a year, and. Um, they lived in a, a nice, we'll call it, I don't know, a half a million or a million dollar house. I don't know what their house cost. He drove a, um, um, a Lincoln Town car. She drove a Miata, whatever that is, some little Japanese car. Um, I just went to George's 50th birthday in Potomac. Um, they live in a, um, a mansion, a, a big farm, 15, 16,000 foot square house, with servants, they are now the lead, leader in their industry in the United States. Um, the, um, and she came away from the seminar. She went to the castle. We'll talk about that later. And the thing that she learned was everything's not Sophie's choice. We have one surgeon in the audience that I know. He may or may not be a life-death kind of surgeon. But unless you're a life-death kind of surgeon, a heart surgeon, you do not make life-death decisions in your everyday work. Full stop. Yet, you take the time as if it were life death on almost everything you do in business. She went away with knowing it's not Sophie's Choice. It was a famous movie, Meryl Streep won an Academy Award for it. Um, he came away with the idea that there's a difference between playing to win and playing not to lose. Those are the only two concepts they came away with and it changed their life forevermore. Key number five. Don't listen to the doofus morons. And I'm not going to get into what a definition of a doofus moron is, but uh, suffice it to say, most of your relatives, your significant other probably, your brothers, you know, it's, uh, mother, father. You know what made us sick? Our parents. My mother and father made me sick and their parents before them. And so on and so forth. And what made my friend with a triple barrel name sick? He's got 800, 900 years. Anybody that keeps track of eight or 900 years of lineage, forget about it. Who gives a shit? And I said, how come you're not a lord or a sir doofus or something? Well, actually, he says, my father's still alive. And I will be. Really? Jolly good. How much more did you have to live? Pay no attention to what the critics say. No statue has ever been erected to a critic. No statue. For those of you that are in the, in the construction or labor industry, I, I decided to put some examples on you might relate to. Would you take advice on plumbing from a guy with leaky taps? Now, in America, that means something else. Leaky taps, which I don't want to get into because this is the new reform me. Would you take advice on a DIY from a guy whose roof was falling in? Now, I tried to buy wicks here about three years ago in this country. And I made all the presentations to all the big uh, venture capitalists, and I'm calling it a DYI. And I made like 15, 20 presentations. We were not successful in buying wicks. And all the people are in trouble, the, the, as you probably read the, the papers. 
And after three weeks of presentations, finally one of my accountants says, you know, Dan, it's DIY, not DYI. I said, who cares? Did everybody understand what I'm talking about? Wix. Yeah. And I said, why didn't anybody, why, why didn't anybody tell me? He said, well, we were afraid that you would scream at us. And I said, well, they, you know, we actually got somebody to fund it, but we, we couldn't buy it. Oh. Now, Lenin was wrong. It isn't religion which is the opening of the mass and it's conventional wisdom. And as you'll see and as you'll hear me talk, speak the rest of today, I mean, if you just did one thing from today and you went against conventional wisdom, you'd be very successful. Break all the rules. 